Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here, as always, with Tom Orr. Tom, how's it going? Tony, we didn't get to watch as much college football this weekend as we did the previous weekend. But what I got to watch, like there was some entertaining college football yesterday. That was that was a really good college football Saturday, which is, you know, everyone, every, every time you come into a Saturday going like, yeah, there, there aren't that many good games. That's always when just like all heck breaks loose. Yeah. And you can almost set your watch by it. And all heck did break loose for, for a number of outlets, a number of games. And we will get into much of it in this weekend recap of the, the biggest and the, the wackiest and the most predictable, I guess, when it comes to Texas and USC and all of that stuff. So, <laughs> but first, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll run down a few of the games. The obvious thing that we have to get out of the way right now, first, Oregon. Uh, 35 28 over Ohio State. If you want to hear us talk more about that, we did our instant reaction show right after the game. So if you want to hear us cover that one, there's about an hour's worth of a podcast for you there where we break it all down. Uh, what, what needs to happen on defense? So, uh, you know, changes that need to be made. Who owns this? You know, all, all of that good stuff, all of the stuff that, and there are plenty of questions from the, the viewers at, the, at that point. So maybe some of the stuff you were asking, they were asking, we were asking, and we talk about that. So you can find, all of that there. So that's that's that. But Tom, now let's talk about the best team in the Big Ten, Iowa, which they're they're two and they they beat they won on the road at Iowa State 27-17. Iowa State was like a four-point favorite, four and a half point favorite. And I I don't want to say I don't know how Iowa does it. They do it with their defense. They got another defensive score. This week, they had at least two on, on their pick sixes last week. They are, they're, 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 they're a suffocating team. I watched Tom, I, I, I have TikTok, right? There's some funny videos on TikTok. I saw a video on TikTok of, it was uh, like, uh, not security cam footage, but just basically um, camera footage of a, a mom and, and her toddler trying to get a night's sleep. And the toddler just keeps moving all over the place and like climbing on her face and sleeping with like it's diaper on her face. And that's basically what Iowa does. They just smother you, put their diaper right on your face. And then before you know it, you only have like 80 yards of offense and you're down by 14 and there's six minutes left to go. And, you know, this is just, you know, Iowa owns the state of Iowa and they proved it once again here. That's what six or seven in a row for them over Iowa state. And, you know, I heard that stat earlier in the week and I was shocked because it seems like, Iowa State's been building and building and building, and Iowa has been largely unremarkable the last couple of years. And it's like, how have has Iowa State not ever actually done the darn thing and beaten Iowa? You look at the two four seven talent composite, and it's like, uh, okay, Iowa's not. Iowa's a team that is not super talented. They are not stacking five stars. That's not how they're building their team. They they are a talent development program, kind of like Mark D'Antonio in the heyday of Michigan State. You get the, you know, you do a good job scouting and identifying players. You do a good job developing them. And then every few years, you can turn that into, you know, what what I keep calling the good Iowa season, where it's like there's the Iowa season, which is somewhere between six and six and eight and four. And then there's every once in a while, the planets all align and you get the good Iowa season where they're like somewhere between 10 and two and 12 and oh or so. They don't come around very often. It sure seems like one is coming around this this year. But when you look at that 247 talent composite, you're like, wow, I was way down at 42. Hey, I haven't seen Iowa State yet. And you keep scrolling, you keep scrolling, and you have to load more teams after number 50, Boston College, and you keep scrolling down, and it's like, oh, there they are, below Illinois. Like, ah, okay. Uh, you know, Matt, Matt Campbell, I'm sure, is catching a bunch of crap today for the fact that he can't seem to beat Iowa. He what he's doing is remarkable given the lack of talent that they, you know, it just it's not like he's a bad recruiter. It's just it's real hard to sell people on Ames when they have other choices like Norman or Austin or South Bend or Ann Arbor or State College or Columbus or any of the other places that are probably more uh you know more desirable college football locations. So you're you're kind of doing it with duct tape and bailing wire to a certain degree. So I mean to to that point. Matt Campbell is do, still doing a remarkable job. He should not, you know, you should not think less of him for the fact that he has not beaten Iowa, but like Kirk Ferentz has one thing he does and sometimes he does it. Okay. And sometimes he does it really well. 
But when he does it really well, it's like, oh, this is this is a team that no one in the country wants to play. And that that's kind of what it's looking like this year. Yeah, they just put their diaper all over your face. <laughs> the, the the recruiting and wanting to go at other places. Ohio State starting running back, Mayan Williams, was an Iowa State commit to give you some firsthand proof of that. And then their Iowa State's best players have not been playing well. Brock Purdy, through three interceptions, was benched. You have um, Brees Hall, their running back, their star running back, has rushed for 69 yards in both of their games. And he's, it's they've been struggling to do quite a lot. The over-under on this time was 45. If you bet the under, you won at 44, which um, <laughs> I think I probably would. I think maybe when we talked about this, I'm, I, I assume I emphatically went with the under. And would not have been sweating this one at all. I, I remember very clearly that I, I picked Iowa to take the points. <laughs> Absolutely. I said that. And I said, I would probably take the under two. And I might even parlay it. So go back and listen. Mm-hmm. Mar- marvel at my genius. And yeah, for sure. Like that that's very much one of those. Like had it the whole way. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, Iowa now has five straight wins over, over ranked opponents. So just put that in the back of your, uh, your pipe and... Uh, you know, or your thinking cap or wherever it goes. <laughs> Metaphors when mixed, <laughs> how hard do I have to mix them? <laughs> Let's go to the second best team in the big 10 Tom. Now the Michigan Wolverines and their 31, 10 win over Washington. This was a, a, an interesting game in the fact that Michigan rushed for over 300 yards again for the second week in a row. They are now leading the big 10 in rushing. I do not remember when the last time they led the big 10 in rushing, maybe like 2000 and, 10 when Rich Rod finally had things going a little bit, or maybe 2011 with Devin Gard or um, Denard Robinson, maybe. But even then, like they were, they've never been running the ball like they have right now. And they're doing it amazingly without almost any ability to throw the ball. Uh, that's, that's the concern. And we will get into all of that in our Michigan Monday podcast tomorrow. Uh, so you, you can, you know, check that out there. But this was just a suffocating performance again from Michigan. They played defense really well. They gave up some passes, but you know, you're going to do that over the course of a game. Both Blake Corum and Hassan Haskins rushed for over 150 yards. That's obviously a big story. The I don't know if it's bigger than Cade McNamara, the quarterback, completing seven of 15 passes for 44 yards. He did not look good. There was a lot of dump offs. There was, you know, like one pass down the field, and that was a 33 yard gain. And then after that, everything else is short uh, behind the line of scrimmage. So while you have this amazing running game with no passing game, you also have no passing game. So that's that's a concern as well because eventually you're going to run into a team that isn't Washington or like Washington and. and you know, Washington rushes for 50 yards against Michigan, which I believe is the exact same number they rushed for against Montana last week. So this is this is not a good Washington team. And every time they showed Jimmy Lake on the on the television, it just looked like he was in way over his head. Yeah, I, I thought Jimmy Lake would be a nice, smooth transition because he was a had been a, an assistant under Chris Peterson for quite a while. And they just sort of did the, you know, baton pass thing like Urban Meyer did to Ryan Day. And I thought, you know, I mean, this is. This is a program that's going reasonably well. Chris Peterson had them in the Rose Bowl against Ohio State, you know, a couple a year before that, I think. It, it's it has just been like shockingly bad how 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 that that whole thing is going in Washington. They have had, I mean, you've had a bizarre amount of talent coming out of the state of Washington the last couple of years, and they're all going to Ohio State. Like that's. You can't have that. You cannot have that if you're Washington. You don't have that many homegrown five stars. You've got to land them. Now, I mean, them going to Ohio State is better than go, them going to Oregon for Washington, for Washington's perspective. But you are you are missing out on a lot of talent right now, and that's that's a big problem. And and you know, it just sometimes you just kind of look and go like, oh, this is a coordinator hire that's just not going to work. And you're sort of seeing that on offense with Washington, where it's just like. What, what do you, I mean, Ryan Day always talks about, what do you hang your hat on? Like, well, what, 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 what would you say you're hanging your hat on right now, Washington? Because your quarterback's not very good. You're not able to run the ball. I mean, you got to double digits this weekend. That was good. That was a real, that was a real sign of progress. So great job there. But yeah, I, I think people came into the year thinking Washington was going to be a Pac-12 North uh, contender. And it sure doesn't look like Washington's going to be able to be in the area code of, 
of uh, Oregon right now. And Stanford had a big win. We may get to a little later on. I mean, that that this is that is like a concerning thing for Washington because it could be. You know, you have you know you have seen Washington at the absolute apex of the sport in the Don James years, mm-hmm. and New Heisel got him back to the Rose Bowl, and then um, uh, Chris Peterson got him back to the Rose Bowl. But in between, like it can get bad there. Like it can if if it gets bad, it can get real real bad. And you go through the Tyrone Willingham t- years and and the. Uh, Keith, uh, what's his name after Don James? Like he he hit brought, hit bottom pretty hard. Um, there, that's a program that if it goes, it can go pretty quick, and it kind of feels like yeah, maybe it's it might it might be going right now. Yeah, it's uh, it, it doesn't look good. Nothing about it looked good, even when they threw for two hundred ninety three yards, but you know, the quarterback is running for his life a lot of it because of Aiden Hutchinson. So, um, yeah, some concerns there. We'll see how they do it in the Pac-10, Pac-12. I, I, I don't expect it will be good. Although, um, you know, I, the, the Pac-12, um, you know, if they get to play USC, maybe maybe things will be okay there. Oof. Tom, let's now move to possibly the best team in Ohio. Uh, Toledo loses to Notre Dame, 32-29. Notre Dame scores in uh, the final minutes of that game. They needed... Oh, 18 points Notre Dame did in the fourth quarter. Now, granted, Toledo scored 13 points in that, in that same fourth quarter, but this was a pretty surprising thing. They were Notre Dame was down 16-10 or 16-14 at the half. Jack Cohen, I believe, was sacked six times in this game, threw a pick six, fumbled, had a finger dislocated that had to be popped back in place. This was, um, I guess, when you you take this, and we'll talk about Florida State later. When, when you combine this, and you look back on last week's Florida State game with Notre Dame, and then you look what happened this week, and it's like, okay, maybe these aren't two really good teams that were playing last week. Maybe these are two pretty average teams that can be bitten by above average lesser teams, and that's what you saw here. Notre Dame put up 453 total yards. But again, they there was a pick six in there, and Toledo ran the ball pretty well. They had a guy go over 100 yards. It, it was this shouldn't happen, and it did. And I, coming into the season, I didn't expect much from Notre Dame's offense because of Jack Cohn, having seen him at Wash at Wisconsin. He played pretty well in that first game. Still has those moments where you're like, okay, that's that's the Jack Cohn I know, and I, I think there's more here, but. You know, the, the inability to run the ball as well as they would like. And w- it, do they have the skill outside? And then w- what's up with the defense as well? There There's some concerns here. And, uh, yeah, they've got Kyle Hamilton, All-American free safety. But I don't know what else they have. They're a 16.5-point favorite, and it came down to the wire. Yeah, that was one that was happening right as we were getting ready to record our post game instant reaction show, and I was like, "Well, let's let's let this one play out and see what happens before we uh, before we go live." Because that was that was not one I saw coming. The the thing that was shocking to me was Toledo's numbers defensively: uh, eleven tackles for loss, six sacks, six quarterback hurries, two forced fumbles. That's Toledo going against Notre Dame, and you know Notre Dame. You think, well, I don't, you know, I, I I'm sure they have no skill talent, but they're always going to have a great offensive line. Like, well. That's how it's traditionally been. I'm not sure about the offensive line this year. And, you know, that's also a little bit of a testament to you can have inferior talent and scheme up a good defense. That is a thing you can do, which, you know, if if you were an Ohio State fan listening to this, uh, there's some interesting context that you might want to consider there, uh, considering the lack of production from Ohio State's defense recently. That's probably something we'll get a chance to talk about a whole bunch this week on uh, later episodes of this podcast. But that that's crazy production. And, you know, you would always prefer to be two and O rather than one and one like Ohio state is right now, but that, that is not a Notre Dame team. Like sometimes there's a Notre Dame team. That's like, you can kind of, you can kind of see them kind of like scraping through the year and maybe squeaking into the playoffs that in and of itself is enough that it's like, Oh, okay. I don't think this is going to be one of those years. No. And, and, We'll, we'll see how their schedule shakes out for them and whether teams live up to their billings or not. But uh, they are flawed, and I think Brian Kelly knows it. So this is going to have to be his best coaching performance in a while. We'll see if it is. Mentioned Florida State. Let's talk about that game. Don't need to spend too much time on it. 
But the way they lost, I mean, we could spend a half hour on it. Jacksonville State, FCS team comes in, beats them 20 to 17. Jacksonville State scores 13 points in the final quarter. And then, uh, you know, also uh, six points in the final six seconds on what some people are calling a Hail Mary, but it wasn't. It was just a deep pass down the sideline that was caught. And uh, then you had a safety there, you had a corner there. And then it's like they were almost like, well, I'm sure, I'm sure he'll get it. No, I'm sure he'll get it. And then they both almost keystone cop it. And then uh, the J- the Jacksonville State receiver runs into the end zone for the game winner. And this was, um, yeah, I, 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 like, I, I thought, and maybe they still are. I thought Mike Norvell's the trajectory was good, but this was a reminder that it takes a while. And this one should. Uh, this is one of those that should never happen. Total yards for Florida State, 335. They were outgained 350 to 335. And they rushed for 202 yards, but, I mean, you should. They can't throw the ball. And uh, it's, you know, I I know everybody was really excited about McKenzie Milton last week, and he was 18 of 31 for 133 yards, one touchdown, one interception. I think he had some good moments last week, but still also fumbled the ball to take them out of, field goal range, even though they made that field goal, but didn't get to count it because there was a timeout. But I, you know, it's, I don't want to say they're reeling right now. Cause I think this is who they are. So. Mm. Yeah. This is a project for Mike Norvell. I mean, he came in and they have just for, it seems like basically since James Winston left after the 2014 season, their their uh, the quality of their offensive line play has just kind of gone down 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 and it's just and and then you know they'll have skill talent but it's like they don't have the time to get the ball to the skill talent because the offensive line has been so consistently terrible for so many years you're sort of seeing that again i mean it's not it's not as bad as it's been but it's still not great and then they have just for some reason they can't seem to get quarterbacks now like that was always jimbo fisher's thing was jimbo jimbo would get a quarterback he put him in the first round of the NFL draft. How did they do after that? Well, it doesn't matter. That's not Jimbo's <laughs> problem anymore. EJ Manuel got his check from the Bills. Like Christian Ponger got his check. Like they're all getting paid. So, but it just, it hasn't happened. They have not had the quarterbacks recently, they, but the offensive line has just, it just killed them. And there's just no reason you go. If you went back and time travel back to the nineties and explain to someone, here's what's going on with Nebraska. Here's what's going on with Florida state. Like Nebraska, you could at least kind of sort of see like, well, Nebraska is not a very talent rich area. So if, you know, they lose access to that talent, if they don't suddenly have a pipeline into Texas or California anymore, like, okay, maybe you can kind of see it. Florida State is rather famously still located in Florida and also very close to Georgia and very close to Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana and a bunch of other school, you know, states that are loaded with talent. There's no reason that you can't get five competent offensive linemen and a pretty decent quarterback there. And, you know, Mackenzie Milton is obviously a fantastic story, but he's not what he was at UCF because that was a real, real, real serious injury when he was at UCF. So you should have someone who is better than a, you know, not a hundred percent Mackenzie Milton. And like, they very clearly do not. And they have not for a long time. And, And that's just one of those. I don't, I don't understand how that program has gone from, what it was under Bobby Bowden. And then it sort of slipped and they came back under Jimbo Fisher and then it slipped again. And it just, they, it's, it's unfathomable that they are, they're at the level that they're at right now. And they just can't seem to dig out of that hole. And Miami is in a similar boat and we may get to talk to them as well. And it's really, yes, everybody recruits in Florida, but they always have. And yet the Florida schools have still been able to maintain some level of success. And now they're, they're struggling. Tom, let's move to uh, Texas A&M's emphatic 10-7 win at Colorado. Number five, Texas A&M. Uh, Tom, I don't want to like make any guarantees, but this is not the year that Texas A&M beats Alabama. I'm just telling you now. We thought maybe coming into the season it could happen. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, starting quarterback Haynes King uh, had to leave the game after like the second possession. Their back and backup came in and. You know, it was like 18 of 38 for 183 yards and a touchdown. Texas A&M, but he did drive down at the end of the game for the game-winning touchdown, the only touchdown for Texas A&M 
in that game. They rushed for 97 yards against Colorado through for 191. But because Colorado is Colorado, you know, they couldn't take advantage of it. Colorado throws for 89, rushes for 171, and probably were just holding on for dear life through that, that entire second half. It's like, let's, let's see whatever we can do um, and, and hope for the best. Colorado was a 17-point underdog. Uh, the over under on that one was 50 and a half. So uh, if, uh, if you, I, I, without doing the math, did that go over or under? Well, let's see. Uh, you, you take the 10 and you take the seven. Nope. That's, that's an under, uh, just barely mm. only by about, uh, you know, 33 and a half points. So they could have had four more touchdowns in there and, uh, they, they still would have been okay. That's, that's a, that's a bad win. If, uh, but it, it'll be forgotten. I do wonder if, uh, not that we talk about ratings here in the rankings, uh, that that should drop somebody. Uh, when I, and when I say somebody, I mean Texas A&M. Colorado, I don't, Colorado's unranked, so I think their ranking will be unaffected. <laughs> but that that's one where if Texas A&M is what you keep hearing that they are, you shouldn't have games like that, backup quarterback or not. I mean, 18 for 38 with your backup quarterback is like, that's not. That's not great. That's obviously going to hold you back a little bit. They had a play earlier in the game where it looked like they had scored the go-ahead touchdown, but he had, the quarterback, I think, had fumbled right before he got to the goal line, so they turned it over there. So it was, you know, it, they could have been up 10-7 earlier in one seventeen seven. I don't think that materially changes the point I'm about to make, however, which is if you are the big, bad SEC team that you're going to be getting gassed up as all year long on all these college football playoff shows, you shouldn't have games like that. They had a game like that. Remember the opening game against Vanderbilt last year where it was, it was, it was some, it, I think it was like two prime numbers. It was 13 to, you know, 13 to five or something. It was a, a bizarre set, maybe 17 to six. One, you know, one of these like how on earth did you do this against a Vanderbilt team that's about to go winless and fire its coach? And it was home and it was week one. Like you should have talent along the lines that allows you to just completely control the game. And it just, it like hasn't happened. And, you know, so they'll bounce back and here's, here's, here's the overall lesson of week two, win the game. And then it doesn't matter because if you win the game, even if you win the game by one point, by the time you get to December, no one's talking about the Vanderbilt game. They're all talking about how, well, look, they've only lost one game and it's to this team. And oh, look. as long as there's W on the on the uh, on the schedule, that's that's all anyone's really paying attention to later in the season, unless they're really starting to nitpick you, especially early season games. So you got to win the game. They won the game. But yeah, I'm, I'm with you. You know, I I don't know how serious that leg injury was for the uh, starting quarterback Haynes. It, if he's out long term, like yeah, that's a that's a concern. Who who do they have coming up on their schedule, Texas A and M? Because you know you you know you, you're gonna have uh, you're gonna have some non conference games at the start where okay you can kind of skate by on mm -hmm. just pure talent, but you know you are going to have you you are not in the SEC East. You are going to have to have to play a couple decent teams during the course of the year. So yeah. when, when when do they play their first decent team this year? Well, uh, they have New Mexico next week. Then they're at Arkansas. And we saw what Arkansas yeah, did. Uh, they could get a little I mean, spicy. Uh, that, I mean, that could be definitely a, a loss if we're. I mean, you don't have to be good right now to beat Texas A and M at home. Like Arkansas is good enough, I think, to beat Texas A and M if if they're if they're as good as we saw against Texas. And not that you have to be that good to to beat Texas, apparently. But you and then uh, after that, it's Mississippi State, then Alabama, October 9th. Which uh, you know, at least it's at home, but I don't know if it's really going to matter on that one. So we shall see. Tom, let us move to the Clay Helton annual. Well, I mean, I can't call it annual because it happens a couple times a year. <laughs> they lose uh, 42 28 to Stanford, and they were, they were what, 17 and a half point favorites. And I'm going to assume it's the biggest line and then lost to Stanford since Jim Harbaugh and Stanford beat them as what 44 and a half point underdogs in 2007 if yeah, I'm the, the correct. famous the famous what's your deal game yes that yes. was a 2007 special yes yeah and USC needed 15 points in the fourth quarter to lose by 14 points and they they outrushed uh Stanford they um 
you know, Stanford outpassed them by 11 yards, whatever. They had more first downs, 24 to 20. They were, you know, six of 14 on third down conversions, pretty fine. They, uh, you know, outgained them, as I said, but they had 109 yards penalty. It's just, they, 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 things were favored for USC in terms of stats and stuff like that. And yet they still just get completely outplayed. And it happens, like I said, at least once a year where it's like, well, this shouldn't happen, but we expect it because it's Clay Helton. You never know when it's going to happen. You just know that it's going to happen. Stanford was bad last week and they came in uh, to, uh, uh, to USC and just manhandled them. And it's, you know, I, I want how, how much longer can US, USC put up with this? Yeah, it's just one conference loss, but I, I don't think it's going to be the last one. And then uh, it, it's probably time beyond time to go to a new coach. But then again, Clay Helton will probably end up, they'll win like their last four and be like eight, four on, on, on the season and regular season and be like, see, I mean, things are trending up. The problem with Clay Helton at this point is, you know, for one thing, I think he's kept his job largely because they've had a bunch of other crap going on there. You know, all the varsity blues stuff. And they've had some, I think they had some stuff with the university president and a medical school. And I mean, like they've had a bunch of other crap that they're sort of dealing with. So that kind of gets pushed off the side a little bit. And so he's just been on the hot seat for like four years now, it feels like. And that hurts you in recruiting, which means now you've had like four classes in a row where you're not getting quite the talent you should be getting at USC. And that adds up. And now, you know, week one, they had a good win over, over uh, San Jose State. It was like 30 to seven. And that was like, that was one of those games where I remember saying on one of these shows, like, that's a game where typically USC comes in and sort of farts around. And it's like a six point game in the fourth quarter. And you're wondering, how can this team with all this talent be in this dogfight with San Jose State? And they didn't do that. And it was like, okay, maybe now, maybe they've got, you know, they've got their quarterback, they've got, They've figured it out. Clay Helton has this thing humming now. And then you come out and just lay an absolute egg the next week against a team that just got drubbed by Kansas State in week one. Like, this is not vintage Stanford. This is not fantastic man ball Stanford that is going to give everyone nightmares. This is not a good team. And they just come in and just embarrass you at home. for probably the 17th time in the last four years, I, I'm going to say the words out loud. This has to be it for Clay Helton, right? Like it, it has to be, I can't, I can't imagine they're going to keep, they're, they're going to keep tolerating it. Cause at this point, like, even when you see something good, you just saw something good and encouraging last week. And then it immediately gets followed up with that, that kind of thud. You can't, you, you can't trust the good news anymore that, you know, that like, okay, well, this is clearly a sign that things are turning around. Because it's just, you know, it's been like up and down and up and down and up and down. And, you, you know, it's catching up with him recruiting. It's catching up with him on the field. You're losing ground to like everyone. You're, you're losing tons of recruits out of Southern California. And they just that, that program is too good. The brand is too strong. You, you can't, you know, this is, this is like Texas. You can't just have a series of coaches just kind of going six and six, seven and five over and over again. The program spends too much money. There's too much access to talent. There's no excuse for doing what they're doing. And they just, it just is year after year after year of that. And I, I feel like this has to be it. You mentioned Texas. So let's move to Texas. They lost 40 to 21 at Arkansas, Texas, a six point favorite in that one. And they were just manhandled. It was 16, nothing at the half, but it was, it, you know, could have been 40 to nothing in terms of how it felt. Arkansas rushes for 333 yards in the game and just they were they were bullies all game long. And that's not with Darren McFadden and Felix Jones running the ball for Arkansas. That's just, you know, with their current roster and nobody nobody went over 75 yards. They had five, five guys over 44 yards rushing in that one. So it didn't matter who carried the ball. They, they were getting yards. They led 33-7 in the third quarter or yeah, late in the third and just did whatever they wanted to do. And what they wanted to do was run the ball and just smash Texas and old uh, Southwest conference foe. And uh, we thought, uh, you know, we being the college football universe, Texas, who'd they beat last week? It was, it was a decent uh, situation, right? What was that? Yes. They beat someone week one. And now my mind is completely I know, blank. Right? Like, yeah, that's where that, that's what happens. But 
it was enough to think, okay, well, maybe there's something here. I mean, they are ranked 15th after all, but then to just get demolished like this, they're, they'll, they'll be unranked. Arkansas, by benefit of being an SEC West team, will probably jump up to at least 15th because, hey, <laughs> they just beat the heck out of the number 15 team in the nation, so they better be up there. And <laughs> the higher they get, the uh, the – the, the more times they can lose was still while still staying in the top 25 for the committee's sake. And really just, just a, a poor performance overall by Texas the bench. I believe they benched Hudson, Hudson card at, at one point, B. John Robinson, 19 carries 69 yards along with 20, which means, you know, eight, 18 carries for 49 yards. Other than that, really no push. And just, it, it wasn't just the offensive line for Arkansas that was dominating that game. It was the defensive line for Arkansas as well. 249 yards of total offense for Texas. Uh, I, I don't want to say it's an embarrassment because that's disrespectful to Arkansas, who is clearly the better team. Well, and week one, uh, Texas beat Louisiana, like the yes. raging Cajuns. That's what it was. And I mean, that, and it was like, that was a game that I thought, you know, Louisiana might be able to give them some trouble. And then it, they, they just kind of kept Louisiana at arm length, arm's length the whole game. And it was like, all right, well, Maybe Sark has this figured out. And then it's like, oh, nope, sorry. Turns out it's still Texas. So it means you're still not developing offensive linemen. You're still not developing defensive linemen because this is what you do. You just you can't win anything in the trenches. So, you know, you, again, you spent all this money. You have, you have all this talent in the state and you just you just you can't ever seem to convert it into anything real. And I mean, you could. You, you can get people to give you an hour and a half on the cultural issues and what the, what the actual issues are at Texas and why this is hap- why this keeps happening. And I get this is game two for Sark. So you're not, you know, no one's writing off Sark right now. You got to give him time. But, you know, it, if, it, this was a little like uh, Mike Leach last year with week one against LSU. It was like, oh, wow, he's completely changed his program. And then week two is like, oh, wow, he has not, in fact, completely changed his program, at least yet. So, yeah. The thing that was starting stunning to me was, you know, you have the talent at, are at Texas. Arkansas was a bad team. I mean, Chad Morris, I mean, drove that plane straight into the side of a mountain for his. He was only there for, I think, two years. But it was like that that team just fell apart under Chad Morris. And you get Sam Pittman in, offensive line guy. So he's going to be big on line play and big on winning in the trenches. I just didn't think they would have the talent yet to really be able to do that. Because they weren't overwhelmingly impressive week one against Rice, but man, they just they just drove Texas straight into the ground. And now I think you know you, we we said I don't know about thirty five times last week. Don't overreact to week one, and then on this one, I feel like we at least I overreacted to week one and thought, oh man, they they, they maybe really have something going here. And no, no, no. In fact, they do not. It is still Texas. Texas is back, but not in the good way. Well, and then I think there's a further hint here when you look at what Louisiana did this week, uh, which was a 27-24 win over Nichols. So they barely, barely held on against uh, an FCS opponent. So maybe Louisiana came into the season overranked, certainly as the like number 22 team in the nation. Tom, that will go ahead and wrap it up. I do want to mention the fact that uh, Texas or Oklahoma State uh, went to the wire with Tulsa, 28-23. They, the, the Cowboys won that one. Just keep that one in mind, Buckeye fans. Tulsa loses by five to Oklahoma State. That was a, a close game. Oklahoma State, I believe, had to come back and win that one. The Ohio State defense uh, will have its hands full with every opponent at this point. That's the only thing you can assume. So, um, you know, they fell by five points to one OSU. We'll see what happens uh, to the next OSU. Then after that time, believe it or not, they play Oregon State. I, that is, I don't know. I, I doubt that's true. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I doubt that's true, but you know, I, I couldn't tell you for sure. I have not memorized Tulsa's schedule yet. Tulsa did week one. Tulsa, I mean, when I talk about not overreacting to week one, week, week one, Tulsa lost by two points to UC Davis. Who, Gerd, do you know who the FCS team UC Davis is coached by? Uh, who coaches them? Yes. I will say, I have no idea. Go ahead and tell me. Earl Mengus. No, it is he's coached by the legendary former Colorado coach Dan Hawkins, who is oh, yes. closer than ever to playing intramurals, brother. He's coaching at the FCS level at UC Davis, and he beat Tulsa week one. So you go from losing to Tulsa, losing to uh, UC Davis in week one to having a fourth quarter lead against Oklahoma State. Like 
this is why you can't overreact to week one. And honestly, now it's like, okay, next week, I guess we'll find out for real what Tulsa is. I, I think we both expected Tulsa to be pretty decent and they, uh, you know, you've gotten two wildly disparate results in the first two weeks. So next week, I guess we really find out what Tulsa really truly is this year. Well, and all of those Tulsa kids, a lot of them, it's the same thing when, when, when Ohio state plays Cincinnati or whatever. And it's like, yeah, a lot of those kids wanted to go to Ohio state, but they didn't get offers. And I assume some of that is the case with the Tulsa kids and Oklahoma state as well. Uh, with, with regard to Dan Hawkins town, say what you want, but he is part of the university of California system. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's say that's UCLA baby. So he's practically the coach at UCLA. The University of California system can't stop hiring former Colorado coaches. First, Rick Neuheisel at UCLA. Now, Dan Hawkins at UC Davis. Get in that UC uh, system, uh, pension system, man. That's uh, that's where the good living is. So that's uh, Dan, Dan Hawkins living his best life. Davis, I hear, is quite nice in Northern California. I've never been. but uh, Then you also have Colorado uh, hiring former UCLA coach Carl Durrell. So there's sure. like a, it's it's like a trading uh, post type of situation or perhaps like borrowing borrowing books and it's like a yeah like like a book club of uh coaches and universities. I think that'll do it Tom. I, we have talked enough about the football games this week. Uh, did want to mention also uh Miami barely getting by Appalachian State. That was uh that one came down to the wire. That was a fun one to watch at the end where this time surprisingly for the first time against the U of M late Appalachian state actually failed. So I'm sure that was fun for all involved. So that will do it for today's show for this weekend recap. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for listening. As always, check out BuckeyeScoop.com. Please become a member if you are not. And if you are, we thank you for that. And you can also find this video and other videos like it as just as you found this video at youtube.com slash Buckeye scoop. And also uh, go ahead and and subscribe there and be notified when we uh, drop all kinds of videos for your perusal. Thank you all, and we will talk to you later.